tell while she does the introduction. Okay. Let me welcome everybody here this afternoon. Thank you so much for coming down, and um, and we are really looking forward to a great session today with Admiral Roughhead. And then, uh, hopefully, members of the media already got this information. But if you didn't, there will be a special um, press availability in the back of the room after this session from five to five forty-five. So members of the press are welcome to join Admiral Dorsett for further discussion uh, at the conclusion of our talks today. Let me turn now to introducing our keynote speaker, Admiral Gary Roughhead, who is now, I believe, uh, three days into his third year as the 29th Chief of Naval Operations. I recently learned that he grew up uh, all, in all kinds of bad places, or uh, interesting places, I should say, uh, Iran, Libya, Venezuela, uh, among others, and um, so perhaps we should get a full list of everywhere you've been <laughs> and uh, keep a closer eye on them. But in any case, um, he decided to embrace that international life by joining the Navy, graduated from the Naval Academy in 1973 as a surface warfare officer. Um, he then went on to six operational commands to include a NATO command, and he is one of only two officers to serve uh, to command fleets in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. He's received numerous, <clears throat> numerous commendations and medals uh, throughout his career, and we're deeply honored to have him here to talk about the changes the Navy is making to better position itself for the information age. So thanks very much. Looking Thank forward you. to your talk. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I think, uh, as Maren alluded to, the places where I grew up uh, properly prepared me for life in Washington. So I'm in good, good company there. But uh, it really is a pleasure to be here with you. And of course, uh, as uh, Marn mentioned, I have uh, Vice Admiral Jack Dorsett, who is uh, our uh, Director of uh, Naval Intelligence and who figures uh, very prominently into the moves that we are making within the Navy, within my headquarters, but within the Navy structure writ large and our approach uh, into the wonderful world of cyber. Um, uh, as Marn also mentioned, uh, in embracing the international life, uh, next week uh, we will be hosting, as we do every two years, uh, the International Sea Power Symposium in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, four years ago, uh, we had uh, 76 countries there. Uh, next week, uh, 106 countries will assemble in Newport, Rhode Island uh, with uh, what we believe right now 100 chiefs of service, of uh, maritime service, uh, to be there. Uh, so that's a pretty significant uh, event for us. But the reason I mention it is because in preparation for it, uh, I was looking back at a speech that was written uh, for one of my predecessors. Uh, for the first International Sea Power Symposium in 1969, um, a speech written for Admiral Arleigh Burke. And I was really struck that I could take that text and deliver that speech next week, and it would be dead on target. Uh, and so I think it makes a lot of sense to me uh, to come here to talk about the future in a place uh, that it has so tied to Admiral Arleigh Burke because he was one of the co-founders. Uh, so it, it's just kind of a, a, a connection that I've enjoyed. But I, I would like to take this opportunity, uh, as I said, to talk about what I think are some rather significant moves that we're making within the Navy to better man, train, and equip the United States Navy for the fight that we're in and for the challenges that we're likely to face in the future. Uh, I came into my current position having spent uh, the past few years with the operational uh, forces of the United States Navy in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, uh, in joint positions and in Navy positions. Uh, and, and it was in that period of time uh, that I had a wonderful vantage point on the uses of information, particularly in an operational sense. How we gathered it, how we processed it, uh, how we managed it, 
how we exchanged it, and most importantly, how we then tried to use it. Uh, I also have had the, the insight recently of being able to make several trips to Iraq and Afghanistan to see how, particularly in the area of uh, special operations, that we have been able to fuse information and, and intelligence into operations in ways that we have never been able to do before and in ways that have made our forces there extraordinarily uh, more effective, where we can use the power of the networks to get the information, the right information, to the right person at the right time to be able to do the right thing. Uh, and, and even though we have been moving along over these last couple of years, uh, I don't think uh, that we in the Navy had gone far enough. And it became clear to me, and this idea really has been germinating now for about three years, uh, that, that we really needed to transform uh, our strategic concepts, uh, the institutions, uh, the organizations, the capabilities and the processes, and I think possibly most importantly, our, our culture. If we as a Navy are to remain dominant in this information age or cyber age or whatever moniker you choose to put on it, I think that we have to take advantage of the new opportunities uh, that exist, such as the vast stores of collected data information and intelligence that often lie at rest, unrecoverable, unavailable, and untapped. To take advantage of the ability to filter, to analyze, and then disseminate that information and to link that information, that appropriate information, to either kinetic or other decisive effects in real time. To take the opportunity to communicate more broadly with people and with more people, and also in that exchange of information to better understand the cultures uh, in which we will operate. To take the opportunity to share that information in ways that we can foster relationships and build the capacity of other militaries, and particularly in our case, other navies uh, that may not be at the same place where we are. Um, and, and to be able to do that in a way that we're not constrained by the barriers that often fall into the path, either because of security issues or policy uh, issues. Uh, and I think that uh, it has been reflected uh, that there's great power in that latter piece with the work that we have been able to do in a very short period of time in areas such as maritime domain awareness and how we exchange that information with other partners, with other navies, with other countries that can contribute and foster uh, increases in defense capabilities and security capabilities. There's no question that as we move off into this area that there are vulnerabilities associated with it. Uh, I think one of the vulnerabilities is our dependency that uh, the Navy does require uh, unfettered access, uninhibited access, to assured communication capabilities in cyberspace. We need that to operate. Uh, the vulnerability, too, that, that cyber in and of itself is a battle space. You know, first we learned how to fight on land, and then we went to the seas, and then the skies and now we're going to be fighting in this newer domain, and we are fighting in this newer domain. Uh, in the business of ships and aircraft, uh, submarines, I think that there exists between the United States and, and other uh, navies around the world. I'm, I'm quite comfortable with the capa capability gaps that we have uh, in those areas of ships, submarines, and airplanes. but. Uh, in cyberspace, that is a much more contested space. And the question for me has been, do we enjoy that same cap capability uh, gap there? 
and we must be prepared to operate in cyberspace when it's denied, and then we must be able to also be able to deny space when it's required or when it's appropriate. And the other vulnerability, I think, is the speed of action and response. Uh, we can make pretty quick decisions in combat today, but I believe the pace is only going to get faster and faster and faster. And as I looked at this, it also was apparent to me that um, cyber is going to be particularly challenging for us because the nature of the cyber domain is, is pretty unique in many ways. I'd say the first is what I'll call the low bar of entry. Uh, you don't have to travel or pay to have great technology to enter into this battle space. So it's a pretty low entry fee to get into it. The second is that speed, uh, and I touched on speed earlier, but speed in cyberspace takes on a new, mis new meaning. We used to be able to think in terms of speed of weapons and how fast they were, and we could talk in minutes, and then it became seconds. But uh, as someone pointed out to me, in cyberspace, when you can do a Google, Google search that can scour the web and come back with 309 million results for the word Google in a tenth of a second, that's speed that is almost incomprehensible, if not incomprehensible. And that also that we're going to be in a domain that in a way is self-governing. The Internet grew on its own out of a need to share information among U.S. government labs, and it's been growing and morphing ever since. And then the fourth being that cyber is going to be a pervasive, a persistent, and an adaptive domain. People are always in it. They are never absent from it. So there is someone in that space all the time. And it affects our lives in some pretty extraordinary ways. Uh, and it is going to constantly be adapting. And because of that adaptation, uh, there's a reason, I think, why Microsoft has had to go to patch Tuesdays instead of a patch a month. Uh, so these are some of the, the challenges that I think uh, are with us in what has shaped my thinking as we move forward. But I would also say that the United States Navy has been no stranger to uh, the world of networks and information and clearly uh, as a service that relies heavily on technology. Uh, we have always had the challenge of communicating over long distances. Uh, from the first time we started, you know, going to sea and, and uh, uh, to show that I'm, I'm not exactly that far forward a thinker when it comes to cyber. I, one of my favorite quotes, I'll also go back to Admiral Arleigh Burke, when he said, going to sea used to be fun and then they gave us radios. So <clears throat> some things haven't changed, as I said. Um, but in a way, the Navy was the first to move to network operations. In fact, the first course that I attended as an ensign in the United States Navy on my way to my first ship uh, was a course in the Naval Tactical Data System, NTDS. Uh, so even from my earliest days, we have been involved in networks and the sharing of information in an electronic medium. And we've been operating with integrated sensors and networks that bridge information and operations between our ships, our airplanes, our submarines, and now our unmanned systems, guided missiles, satellites, facilities ashore, and our computer networks. In the time that we have done business in these domains, uh, we've developed important relationships with other institutions. Uh, organizations like DISA and NSA, and that too has kind of shaped uh, who we are, how we think, and how we do business. And we as a Navy have also uh, had some pretty proficient operators 
and we have instituted some fairly top-notch schools in the area of uh, cyber operations and uh, uh, cryptology. Uh, Admiral Grace Hopper, one of our earliest luminaries, uh, is someone who uh, is somewhat of a giant in this. We in the Navy were designated the executive agent for joint cyber warfare in 1999, and we established the Joint Schoolhouse in 2001. And then in 2004, we stood up the Cryptologic Technician Network rating, uh, specifically focused on cyber operations. And outside of cyber, but very important to information dominance, Navy has what I would say an elite intelligence, communication, information operations, and oceanography professionals within our cadre, officer and enlisted. And I believe that all of these efforts over the last decade have positioned us to lead in cyber in a way that the nation would expect. So while we are well positioned and we have experience and we have talent, uh, I'm not sure we have taken enough of a bold or comprehensive approach and one that can really leverage the world of cyber in our operations to ensure that we have the access and to enable better decision making on the part of our operators. And this is why I directed uh, the reorganization of my staff and made three what I consider to be important moves uh, for the Navy. The first uh, is on my staff to combine the Director of Intelligence and the Director for C4I into one entity, uh, into now instead of an N2 and an N6. It will become an N26 or the Director for Information Dominance. The legacy platform-centric approach that has been part of our Navy for so many years, the ships, the submarines, the airplanes, I believe uh, is the way of the past. Those artificial divisions, uh, and in some cases they have been not too artificial, particularly as you get into budgetary issues, uh, have really caused us to sub-optimize our ability to aggregate combat capability and the movement of information in ways that can maximize the effectiveness of a fleet, uh, of a unit, or of an individual. So we're bringing together the resource sponsorship for all of our information-related capabilities into one entity, and that will include intelligence, networks, electronic warfare, cyber, meteorology, and oceanography, space, and unmanned systems. They will all be resourced in one organization, and we will manage those capabilities collectively and holistically to achieve information dominance for the Navy and for the joint and interagency partners. Uh, the reorganization is moving quickly, as it should, and will be complete by the end of this year. Uh, and N26, or the Director of Information Dominance, uh, will be the one making the major investment decisions as we prepare our 2012 budgets. Uh, and as someone asked me this morning, um, you know, where are you along this timeline? And I uh, think the quote from Hernando Cortez applies. Uh, we've burned the boats. There's no going back. So, Jack, you're the helmsman. Um, we are also establishing uh, the Fleet Cyber Command. It will be the service component to uh, U.S. Cyber Command at Fort Meade. He will be dual-hatted as the Commander Fleet Cyber Command and Commander 10th Fleet. It's a similar model uh, organizationally and functionally as uh, we have with NavSent and 5th Fleet. So uh, two, uh, uh, ent or one entity, but, but basically two functions 
that will enable Fleet Cyber Command to execute the operational uh, missions required uh, by U.S. Cybercom and by uh, the Navy. I'm often asked, why, why Tenth Fleet? Uh, it has some historical roots. There was a 10th Fleet in the United States Navy at one time. In World War II, there was a new threat that came on to the scene that was strangling Great Britain and seriously affecting our ability to control the seas. And that threat was called a submarine. And we couldn't get our head around how to get after these submarines. Um, we had some information, some intelligence, but we couldn't synchronize the intelligence and the operations. So Admiral Ernest King stood up 10th Fleet, and we were able to overcome the cyber or the submarine uh, threat that existed at that time. So 10th Fleet will be reactivated as uh, as uh, cyber fleet. And while N26 will focus on the investments that will ensure our dominance, Fleet Cyber Command will focus on the operations. Fleet Cyber Command will be the cyber operator for the Navy. And I think, as in all things for me, the most important element of any organization uh, is the, the people. And that, I think, is the most important change that we're going to make. The technology, I believe, is, is going to be available to us. Uh, but people who will operate in this domain uh, will be in a premium because there will be great competition for their intellect, for their experience, and for their competence. So people are going to be the key. So what we have done, <coughs> excuse me, is to take our already very proficient and experienced uh, operators um, and create with them and with others uh, an information dominance core. Right now, we have uh, a lot of ratings, a lot of specialties within the Navy uh, that in and of themselves are a bunch of different communities, different structures, if you will. And we will combine them into an information dominance core. Uh, it will include uh, our uh, information professionals, information warfare, intelligence, cryptology, the aerographer's mates, um, uh, uh, IT professionals, they will all be combined into an information dominance core. Uh, and when you add that together, it will constitute about 44,000 sailors in the United States Navy. Uh, they will retain their individual identities, but they will be managed as a core. They will develop as a core and they will fight as a core. So the goal in doing this is to ensure that the commander gets the right information to the right place at the right time so that they can effectively perceive, understand, reason, decide, and as the culture of the Navy, command. That's what all of this is about. These are important changes that I believe uh, we needed to make, that we now have made, to realize a more effective operational environment uh, for the Navy. So I'm pleased that we're underway, and as I said, uh, this is where we're headed. And with that, I'll take any questions you may have. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. I was. I'm sorry. And it's restricted line officers. And I'm wondering how you see these changes, this convergence of intelligence and operations affecting that both structural and cultural, I don't want to call it divide, but, but bifurcation in the Navy. Yeah. I, I think what we will see as a result of this and as a result of the creation of the Corps and the identi identity of the Corps uh, is a, um, a warfighting community that will be viewed and seen and considered as uh, as, a, as clearly a warfighting dimension of the United States Navy and not a, 
a supporting uh, a branch of the Navy. Uh, and we are also uh, going to be moving uh, in, uh, in the direction of, at least initially, limited direct accessions into the information dominance core, which was something we have not done, excuse me, as you know, in the past. Stan. The um, terms and your initial memo for the new N00X uh, capability on regarding capabilities assessment read very like what N81 does now. And in the Navy uh, planning part of the PPB process, what is the line as you begin to implement this between the traditional warfighting capability assessments and functions of N81 and the new maybe overarching capability assessments of the N00X? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. And, and I didn't uh, talk about that, but in addition to the, uh, the cyber adjustments on the staff, we're also creating uh, a director of warfare integration. Uh, the designator is 00X is what we've put on it. And the reason it's 00X is because that director will be uh, a direct report to me. And the, in, the intent of 00X is not to do detailed analysis but rather to take into account the analysis that, that is available to us, uh, to look across the portfolio, uh, many portfolios within the Navy, not just the platform uh, portfolios, and to be able to look at those areas where we uh, want to uh, accept or reduce risk and, and advise me on where the investments need to be made. So it won't be as much detailed analysis, but rather stepping back, looking across the entire Navy, the activities that we have going on, the re investments that we're making to, d to uh, provide direction as to where we can move, where we should throttle back a little bit and, uh, and, and paint a more uh, complete picture of uh, of what I refer to as the entire kill chain, from that first tickle of intelligence that you need, uh, all the way through the options that you have, uh, all the way to potentially a final kill. And so uh, that's what I'm looking at 00X uh, to look at. Clearly, uh, I would also uh, see them providing certain looks at particular warfare areas, uh, dimensions of warfare and being able to provide uh, top-level assessments uh, that I can use in, uh, in developing uh, my decisions. Yes, ma'am. About the international partner aspect to this, and as you guys are restructuring yourselves internally, how are you going to also work with your international partners that maybe aren't up to speed in making all the changes that you are to address the cyber problem? Yeah. Well, I, I think actually um, by consolidating a, these activities into one entity, uh, I, I think that we can have a more coherent view for our partners as we work on things like uh, maritime domain awareness, um, uh, uh, data links. I mean, it, we in the Navy now have to go to a variety of different organizations within uh, in the Navy to address these various things. Uh, N26 or the Director of Information Dominance, all of that will be resident in the one organization. Uh, and I would say that initially, the most active area is probably going to be the portfolios that have the maritime domain awareness uh, activity associated with it because uh, that's where much of our international effort is right now on reaching out pretty much regionally with other navies uh, and other maritime services uh, to get some interoperability going there. So I, I think it's going to work much better in that regard. Sir. Admiral, you mentioned uh, speed of action and response. And uh, currently, the Trident Warrior series uh, generally takes one or two years at a minimum uh, to field new systems. And also, we have a lot of times the accreditation uh, where people don't necessarily assess things to be in 
risk adverse, but rather risk intolerant. Mm -hmm. And so it stymies uh, innovation sometimes within the Navy. Right. So how do you see these uh, changes uh, so that uh, we can field uh, new systems uh, to the fleet faster? Right. Um, I think that is uh, a great frustration of mine, how long it takes. Uh, as an operator, you, you want it yesterday uh, when you see something that's promising. And, and, and quite frankly, that uh, is a, a significant driver in how I got to where I am, being able to get the complete look at what we're dealing with. Uh, for example, in the area of sensors, and I know Jack will talk in greater detail about how we're going to uh, be, be put together. But in the area of sensors right now, I can go to multiple uh, leads, whether it's an underwater sensor, above water sensor, or on the water sensor. Uh, all of that now will be in one place, and I think we can make a better decision about where the right investment will be, and, and is it, is it, you know, are we being redundant, or are we uh, leaving some gaps, and then the OOX uh, organization is who I will rely on to be able to uh, talk about those, and in fact, I just came from our Office of Naval Research, and uh, uh, we're going to be putting uh, someone from the Office of Naval Research into OOX so that we can look at um, what might be out there. Uh, we'll have the common view from info dominance and then uh, make decisions based on that and and work to drive to uh, uh, earlier realization. I'm not naive uh, in thinking that there will not be impediments and that there will not be inertia, especially when you're displacing one program for another. Uh, but I believe that this will give us a more common view and a more uh, synchronized view as to where uh, we will get the best return on that money. Yes, sir. Admiral, uh, as you all well know, uh, this generation of sailors have fairly high expectations to remain connected to family and friends right. uh, while they're deployed and underway uh, through social networking and uh, sites like Facebook, uh, and, and also, as you all know, a lot of bad things happen on the Internet. Will the N26 organization and, and Cyber Command be involved both in the war fighting and as well as the uh, the social or morale end of yes. cyber in, in terms yes. of shaping policy? Or? If it's a network, uh, if it's moving information in some way, it will be the director of information dominance that will have that. And you touched on a very good point. Uh, there is no question that that is going to become more and more uh, uh, important to us as we go forward. Not simply from the standpoint of the expectations of young people who are coming in to the, um, into the military today uh, and, and the, the security issues associated with it, uh, the costs associated with it, uh, but, but the value that, that comes from it. Uh, I'm intrigued by it, uh, and, I, and I get the risk, and, and I see the value today uh, in a pretty good way. But I go back to several years ago when some of us first started to hear of something called chat. And chat was just something that, you know, was out there go in any command center in any service today, that is how we command and control. And I would venture to say that the person that heard about chat when it first popped into the lexicon never envisioned where it was going to go. And I think that some of the power that we see in the social networks I think we're on the front edge of something that potentially uh, will change the way that we communicate uh, and exchange information and awareness uh, in, in, in the future. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I can guarantee you it ain't going to look like what it is today. And the young people that we have today, especially these folks that we're talking about being in the Info Dominance Corps, 
are going to teach us things that we never thought possible. And so that's where I think this is going to take us. And by the way, you can find me on Facebook if you want to. <laughs> Mitzi, for you. I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Sobrowski Institute. I want to take off on that, which is foreign languages. And a lot of information gets through language, right? right. It's, it's not just. So my question is, what are you doing about expanding the population that can be able to speak the languages. I mean, I look back on World War II where one of our advantages was Navajo because nobody else could understand it. And it seems to me we're on the other side of that stick right now. Mm -hmm. Well, I, we have uh, in our enlisted ranks, we've incentivized uh, the learning of languages. Uh, in our commissioning programs, we've done the same thing. Uh, I think the challenge, uh, you know, for us is is to be able to uh, get the right balance between when do you teach the language, what degree of proficiency do you want, and what's the return on that investment. Um, you know, is it better that you expose a lot of young officers as ensigns uh, to a particular language uh, with the intent that one of them as a captain is going to become the attache to that particular country? Uh, or that they will be conducting maritime security operations with that country? Or do you seek ways as you neck down on those assignments to have effective ways of teaching that language? So I think we've, what we've done is we've started to immerse more of our sailors into second languages. Uh, but I also believe that we need to think about when, where, how much, and to what end. And, and I'm very interested in that because you're absolutely right. I think there's, there's a language component, but then there's also the cultural awareness component. And I'm not sure you have to have both all the time. Um, but I would submit that you, when you go somewhere, you have to have the cultural awareness. And then the language is, uh, is something that I think is additive to that. Uh, in the back, yes, sir. Um. Uh, I'm Harry Inman. I'm a lawyer. I'm just curious how you protect, protect your communications. In other words, if you're sending something out, can somebody hack into it? Uh, is there, uh, there's a security aspect to the whole thing. Uh, oh, yes, sir, without question. Uh, uh, the security aspect is huge. Uh, and that's why I believe that having uh, an organization and a fleet uh, that is looking globally, that, is, that has the right uh, skills and folks who are trained and experienced in it uh, is, is the best defense there. I do not uh, think you're ever going to get to the point uh, where the attacks are going to stop and it's just a question of, of how you prepare yourself and present yourself to be able to counter the attacks, recover from the attacks, um, uh, and the policies that you put in place uh, to make sure that you don't become so overly protected that you're not passing any information either. So I, I don't know if that hit on the, on the question or not. I'm yes, sir, in the back. Yes, Admiral. Uh, Gil Duval from the I College at National Defense University. I was wondering if you could uh, Elaborate a little bit how you think uh, these initiatives will affect JPME. Thank you. How they'll affect JPME? Um, I, I think it's, it really is probably a, uh, what I'd be more interested in is, is how, how is JPME teaching our people about this environment and by developing a cadre of experts uh, and experts may be too bold a word because I think this is going to be uh, a constantly evolving uh, field of knowledge. Uh, but I do believe that uh, this information dominance core can become the pool from which uh, the JPME programs can, can bring in the pros uh, who are current, uh, who are practiced in, in being able to impart uh, the knowledge uh, that they've gleaned over their experiences to to the commanders and to the practitioners that are coming along. 
So I think it, it, it will create a pretty robust group of folks, uh, well-grounded, well-versed, and well-practiced in uh, information operations. Yes, sir. Dick Diamond from Raytheon. Um, if I were one of those 100 service heads up in Newport next week that hear about this, I might be tempted to think, oh, brother, there they go again. They're going to leave us further behind in my service. And the U.S. Navy tends to do the great things first and maybe think of us as an afterthought. Are there components of your changes that will keep our partner capacity sort of apace with us uh, from the get-go, or is that something that's going to come later? No, I, I think uh, uh, that this will uh, help us put uh, the initiatives that we have underway with our foreign partners in a better context with what we're doing than what we currently do now. Um, right now, um, the, a lot of the command and control activity is, it either has its foundation in, in the N6 or in the N8 as you get into some of the, the, the higher end uh, war fighting paths or data paths that we use. The, the Maritime Domain Awareness Organization and the activities that take place there are in my N35 organization. Uh, so I now have three directors who make, are making decisions that affect that balance and that access and the consideration for our foreign friends and partners. This will all be in one entity, uh, and, and the decisions that we make with regard to uh, maritime domain awareness, data links, our maritime ops centers will all be done within one organization as opposed to spread out across several areas uh, within the, uh, the organization. So I think it's going to be a, a positive. And, and if there's one area that we have uh, worked extraordinarily hard and where it's been my pleasure in the past couple of years to see some terrific progress made by our Navy component commanders at regional levels, it's been an MDA and the way that we have pulled regions together uh, and now are in the process of connecting regions. Uh, but it's not a U.S. only show. Uh, uh, today I, I, I have my Italian counterpart here and he is the spark plug on many of the coalition activities that we have going on and, and we intend to keep it that way. But this is actually going to help us do that. I think we have uh, uh, one more. One more. So we have two up front when we get okay. there. There's one over here in the shirt and tie, and then if somebody popped here, I'll take that one as well. So. Um, in, in your speech, you mentioned technology gaps. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit and, and specifically state what some of the uh, technology capability challenges that you face are? Well, uh, my comment there really was uh, gaps that I think favor us. Um, as I've often said, in talking about the Navy today, uh, capability is not what I worry about most. Capacity is what I worry about most. So uh, as you look at in the individual warfare areas, um, you know, we enjoy uh, some pretty incredible systems and capabilities. Um, and so I do believe that there is a little bit of a buffer that we enjoy. That's not that we rest on our laurels, but uh, for me, it's it's capacity uh, that that has my attention today. Admiral, um, question on the acquisition process of moving these technology faster. You made the comment early about Microsoft doing patches a week versus patches a month. Um, what's going to be the view vision now of moving acquisition processes faster so that you can move things? to the tactical float into the desktop faster so that technology is available to the sailors, as was brought up earlier, they're getting more social networking. But clearly there's a counterpoint to that where you also have to secure that if you're going to release it faster. Do you have any comment on that process of moving that along? Um, what I would say is I think that's a process that needs to be attacked. 
uh, because the speed with which uh, this is moving and the speed with which the acquisition pace moves, it's, it's, it's not there. Uh, I'll be working with Sean Stackley uh, as we go forward to see how we can uh, accelerate that, but it's uh, not just a Navy issue and we're going to have to have to get into it. But uh, there's no question uh, that we often get involved in some pretty cumbersome processes and programs uh, that by the time we get it out there, uh, it is extraordinarily expensive in its technology of uh, years past. I'll take one more and then uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jack Dorsett who can just nail every detail that you guys have. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, your remarks uh, have, have been uh, wonderfully enlightening. Uh, in, in the area of um, pointing out that the Navy is truly positioned to take this, uh, the context seemed to be within Department of Defense. Clearly, cyber affairs affect uh, society in general, every, in, in every agency, every department. Where does the Navy, uh, where do you vision the Navy being in the interagency uh, as well as the international? Yeah. Uh, well, I, where I envision is uh, the organization that I've put in place uh, clearly will be uh, vested within the Department of Defense, and then Fleet Cyber Command will be the naval component uh, of U.S. Cyber Command. And so uh, it's not that, uh, that we become, uh, you know, the figurehead or the leader. That's not my intent. But it's the intellectual effort that we can put behind this, uh, the way that we can take the schoolhouses for which Navy has responsibility and really advance the programs there to truly make them world class. Uh, for us to be able to put our intellectual effort and our energy into um, seeking out and determining good investment decisions and then uh, to go back to the acquisition uh, question, what can we do uh, to contribute to the evolution Indeed, one might say the needed revolution in acquisition as it applies to cyber uh, entities. So I think that, uh, you know, that is a role uh, because of where we have been, the talent that we have, the duties that have already been passed to us in terms of, of training and education, uh, and to simply accelerate that and become a driver uh, for change and, and uh, relevance as we move into the future. Well, I, th I thank you for your time, your great questions, and, uh, and your interest in this topic. Uh, it, is, uh, it will become increasingly important. Uh, there is no question that uh, uh, it is not the easiest of, uh, of, of areas uh, in which to operate. It's going to continue to uh, challenge us, but this uh, in my opinion, uh, puts the Navy in a position to be organized so that we can man, train, and equip our Navy and contribute to the joint force in a way that's relevant for the future. So uh, thanks, CSIS, for this opportunity. Thank you so much.